Assassin's Creed Mirage was the last holdout for the core fans of the original games. The people who enjoyed those games were holding out hope that we were getting a return to form. That we were actually getting a stealth based Assassin's Creed game and it was going to be around a character within the Brotherhood for the first time since 2016. Anyone who's watched my content before already knows my dislike towards Valhalla. But to summarise, my issues around the game was the marketing towards the return to form with the use of social stealth, which was nothing more than a pandering to the original fans. However, it wasn't useful in the game at all. I also found that the game was extremely bloated with content that had nothing to do with the main story, but was being put in for the sake of getting the numbers up. I believe that some of the areas within the main story content were initially made as side content, but due to the desire to have a high runtime, it was crammed into the main story. We also had the fact that the open world itself just wasn't interesting. It was visually stunning, but nothing was being added by exploring the world outside of little moments where you find chests to give you a little bit of dopamine. The reason why I'm bringing up my issues around Valhalla is they played a massive hand in how I prepared myself for Mirage. After two releases of non-Assassin's Creed games, we were supposedly getting an actual return to form. For me, my expectations were incredibly low. To be fair to them though, they did hit some of them with this game. The reason for this, as I previously mentioned around Valhalla's release, but also the fact that this game was originally going to be a DLC for Valhalla, and didn't have adequate resources to make it into a full-fledged game in comparison to most games previous. So not only was my fear for Ubisoft's deceptive marketing kicking in, but so was my fear for another game being more similar to AC Rogue when that game released. A game that had a ton of potential but wasn't given enough resources to truly compete against the other games within the franchise. So going into this game, I was simply hoping that stealth would be a priority, for the combat to not be the main focus and the parkour to be decent, and lastly, the story to actually be based around a member of the Creed. And they did all of these within this release. Within this video, I'm going to go over everything I experienced with this game, what I loved about it and what I hated. I'll be talking about how this game was a good step in the right direction, but sadly falls short on some aspects. And one big factor that I'm going to talk about later on in this video is around how Ubisoft seemed to not understand what makes certain games work and what makes their games not work. So sit down, grab a cup of tea, and let's talk about the game that could have saved the franchise. Before we walk into the territory of spoilers, I'll let you know my thoughts on whether or not this game was a good purchase at launch, and if it's worth it after a couple of months. The answer is yes, I do think it was worth the money if you bought it from a company like CD Keys or G2A for example. I bought my copy on PC from CD Keys that only cost me £30, and that was the price that I bought it on launch day, and even prior to that it was going for pre-orders on CD Keys for that price. Which in my opinion is the correct price for this game. I do think that £50 was acceptable for its launch due to its undercutting of most AAA games by £20. However, I would say that if this game was truly finished and didn't have issues around its general performance, bugs, odd choice in narrative, and then some decent side content, then they could have easily gotten away with the £70 price tag. So if you can get this game for around £30, then I don't think you'll be walking away from it feeling as if it wasn't worth the money. Just before jumping into spoiler territories though, make sure to hit that subscribe button if you enjoy long form video essay content like this where I'm diving deep into games and topics within the gaming world. If you want to support the channel any further then make sure to go join the Patreon which will give you early access to videos like these and allow you to get involved in the process of making future content for the channel. And lastly, if you want to join a community of like-minded people who like to talk about games, books, and pretty much anything else, then make sure to come join the Discord link down below. But now let's talk about Mirage and the story around it. This story starts off with a monologue from William Miles, which was cool to hear. I think it allowed the player to delve right into the tone of this game. You'll see Basm having a nightmare and waking up to talk to his friend Nihal. This character is incredibly important and is the reason to push the player into a second playthrough later on. We get shown the city of Anbar and within this moment we're also seeing some changes towards the parkour. Something that I'll discuss way more in depth later but the quick rundown of it is that the parkour isn't anything special, it's very similar to Valhalla, however 
the choice in environment is truly what allows this game to feel like an old AC game. Then the first few parts of this game are nothing more than setting you up to understand the main mechanics for the stealth aspects, which is obvious, stealth and social stealth, but also thievery. Basim and Nihao will then go talk to Dervis, a leader of the thieves. Basim is given the job in getting a hold of a ledger. After going, we'll head back for our reward and see Roshan for the first time, in the iconic assassin's robes. And something rather uncommon happens within the franchise, which is we feel left out of the creed, which is normally very unusual. A feeling that will definitely stay with us throughout the whole game. Basim will attempt to impress Roshan, trying to be given bigger and better contracts. Something again that we only truly learn the reasoning for later in the game. As Basim knows roughly what the assassins are seeking, which is an artifact within the main palace, he'll try to gain their respect by getting a hold of it. And the assassins within this game are looked at as more of the people's group, which is definitely interesting. I'd say that other games are very similar. However, the way that this game sets it out, I would say is a lot more similar to like Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood than any other game. I would say that this is true within the other games, but within this, it really feels like they are a group that relies on the likeness of people to truly continue their mission. We'll sneak into the palace and come across a meeting of masked men. Anyone who's been around the franchise for the last three years will know that this group is the predecessors of the Templar Order. They're seemingly threatening the Caliph, who is the leader of the city. This is something that I really like within this game, as it's setting up the Order as a group that is truly threatening and powerful something that Valhalla lacked due to the last 15 hours. Basim will open the box and find the artifact inside, which is a strange disc. Fans of the franchise will know that this has something to do with the Isu, and it's got striking similarities to the same key that was used within Assassin's Creed 3, which gives us, the fans, an indication on the importance of this device. Upon touching the Isu artifact, images will start to appear, which we can't explain. The Khalif will attack and strike Basim. Just before being strangled, however, Nihal will stab the Khalif, making Basim a witness to the murder. We will proceed to truly get involved in the parkour mechanics, in an escape route put in front of us. Basim is constantly questioning what has just happened, showing the empathy that he has to the situation that's just unfolded. This shows us something that you rarely see within Assassin's Creed games, which is simply that he doesn't want to kill people without reason or for vengeance, which is very rare in this franchise. Basim will then fall asleep having the same nightmares from earlier around the genie, ending with him waking up and Roshan is sat there. She'll ask Basim about the artifact and what he knows. After this, we head to a location given to us by Roshan to escape the city as everyone will be hunting for the killer of this city. We'll get a moment to be shown how well trained Roshan is in a little fight sequence and then find Basim drowning. And then he'll be coming up for air, swimming away from the genie, finding ourselves in a construction castle. Once on land, we head over to our first training session with Roshan. The second hour of this game is truly showing us how to actually play the game. I mentioned this within my AC2 video essay, but most Assassin's Creed games will follow a similar structure, which is typically the first sequence is there to set up a lot of the story narratives, and the second sequence is set up to teach us a lot around the gameplay, and then typically it will jump between both of those each sequence, and then that way it gives us that feeling as if we are improving throughout the game. After Basim fails to perform the Leap of Faith, we'll head deeper into the Assassin's Stronghold. We'll overhear a conversation between a person who appears to be housing the Assassins and the leader of the Creed, Rayhan. This moment was one of my favourites within this entire game, as it completely threw me off the scent of what I thought was going to be getting played out. It left me feeling as if Rayhan would eventually betray the Assassins, and it made me suspicious of the wrong person. After collecting Basim's sword, we will begin most of the combat tutorials. He'll first do throwing knives, and the second will be a one-on-one -on -one with Roshan. And then once we've completed that, we'll find ourselves sat around a campfire which is cut short to go out on patrol to deal with some invaders. This allows us for the setup to actually go to Baghdad for the first time. We learn of our allies there and proceed to do a training sequence. I've seen some discussion online around this idea of people not being too fond of the fact that everything goes by really quickly. However, I would definitely much rather have had this where we get a little montage than playing for an extra hour just for the sake of it. We get to see Basim learning and going from being an unconfident in his own abilities to learning how to perform a leap of faith completely. Basim takes the pledge to become a true assassin as well. 
showing us for the first time in a long time an actual initiation into the creed being performed. He is fitted with a hidden blade, the first of its kind that we've seen for six years. We'll take on Roshan as a part of training and see a fallen brother appear. The start of this game truly begins with Roshan, Basim, and this guy whose name I'm going to not try and pronounce as I'll butcher it, heading off to Baghdad. We'll see the journey going through the desert, and we'll then get the title card of Assassin's Creed Mirage. After finding the hideout within this district, we'll be sent off to go follow some clues. For myself, I went to Dervis, the man who we used to take orders from just an hour ago. After that catch up, we find ourselves meeting a man called Beshi who is in need of his men being freed. This is when we get our first proper introduction into the stealth experience that this game has. And we also learn about our first actual target. He's a man in search of something within the desert. Beshi will then hand us a token that actually allows us to deal with future missions in different ways. Again, as I mentioned earlier, a good AC game drip feeds us content over a period of time to give us the illusion of progress. And this is one of them. We go to find the man named Ali who has been trapped deep within the prison. And after getting the brashful man out of prison, we'll head to another location in which he'll give us some information about the man that we're after. Which leads us to the end of the chapter and gives us our first black box mission. Something that we haven't seen since Assassin's Creed Syndicate, which was released back in 2015. This location ends up showing us truly how much more reliant you are within this game on the stealth. Within this takedown, we learn that the Order knows that Basm is more than just who he is, but it's very vague and such a small part that is easily forgettable, which in my opinion was an awful choice to do. After having killed someone in the story, we will then deal with the genie yet again, which then unlocks Assassin's Focus, a controversial part of this game which I'll get into later on. Basm will also see Nihao there, which will then spook him. Roshan will tell Basm to go and find Nihao and cut off the loose end. Nihao will then show us how she's been trying to understand what the symbols mean from the artifact that they had encountered. She acts in a way to taint Basm's mind in wanting to understand more of what is his personal vested interest. Roshan will then send us off to go find the different bureaus and start doing work for them. We'll also unlock a new ability, for myself I chose smoke bombs to begin with, and after making our way to the first of many of the bureaus, I was then sent off to the House of Wisdom to do some investigations. We'll find a load of books that have been lit on fire. We end up seeing Nihao once again who will give us a book. This leads us eventually to follow an assistant who brings us to a trap. We find out that someone has been threatening members of the House of Wisdom. We learn of a dig site which is the next location that we're going after. Just beforehand, we need to try and find the caretaker of books. And within that, we end up finding out that something extremely weird has been going on within the House of Wisdom. In the attempt to learn more information about the caretaker, we'll be sent to a man who is being held captive to try and transcribe a book. We learn about a scholar who is in charge of the operation. And in doing so, we learn that her name is Zara, and we head to her house to find out her involvement in the Order. During this time, we'll learn that she is indeed a part of the Order, and in doing so, we will now have to take her down. She was in charge of getting the book transcribed, hoping it would allow them to find whatever use it was of their great work. We then head to that excavation site to learn more about everything that we were being told about earlier on. We then learn more about a doctor of whom we find evidence that he is in fact again another member of the Order. After taking down the doctor, Hamid will come into the room who is a member of the Creed. He's been told about a mechanism that as he says can open the doors to perception. We know that this is some form of animus which utilises genetic memories if you've been around the franchise for any period of time and especially Valhalla. And with that we now know that our next target is Rabisu, I believe that's how you pronounce his name or something like that. Which leads us now to our next assassination. Heading to the Great Symposium to find our next target. While gathering info we meet Nihal yet again, who has brought us to see another set of markings. We're now starting to see how Basm is permanently shutting out any form of understanding into his own existence. We end up attending the lecture of the targeted man, however another person will appear, letting him know that an assassin is within the area and that he needs to go away. 
And now we start our next black box mission. After we end up going through a load of different bits, we end up disguising ourselves as a patient to then get further and farther in learning what this artifact in fact is. While he is telling us what he's been working on and what this great work is, we will then assassinate the man. And yet again, we are confronted by the genie. Outside, we'll end up seeing Ni Hao yet again, who is again prompting Basm to not forget about his past. We let Tadbid know what has been going on and what was needed to be done. And this now means that we have completed two of the four bureaus. And in doing so, we'll head to the next one, which for me meant that I met up with Ali and we find out that he basically wants to start a war. We have to find out where these rebels have been taken off to and being taken captive. After meeting up with Ali to start this next mission, we find him torturing a prisoner, which for the first time, we're actually being showed that Ali isn't actually that much of a good guy, which is very rare. Most Assassin's Creed games paint a very black and white narrative. It's one of the instances within an AC game where we're kind of more or less siding with the enemy of our enemy instead of an actual true ally. After stalking some soldiers, we'll find out where the rebels are being held captive, and alongside Ali, we'll attack a villa and take down Dogen to free the remaining rebels. And to me, one thing that I will point out about the rebel storyline is that I felt that most of it was just kind of fluff for the sake of it, instead of kind of adding value to what is the story of this game. Not to the same extent as I would say within Valhalla, where it needed to be removed, but it's enough that makes you just want to get through the content as quickly as possible. We end up heading to a meeting that we learnt about by taking down Dogen, in which we end up learning way more about different members of the Order, and who our top target of this subsection is in this part of the Order. And in the conversation that we were just overhearing, we then find our two next targets. Both are simply showing us that the Order has its grips over the soldiers and not the Caliph. And after taking down both of those men with Ali to get Beshi back, we end up finding that he has been taken captive. We learn about how the governor doesn't actually have that much power in the place that he is meant to as well. And now it is time for our next black box mission, to complete the third bureau. Once inside of this location, we'll take down the warlord who killed Beshi. We'll then take down Wasif, who is the man who did all of this. We let Ali take credit for this guy's death, as it allows him to continue being followed by his men instead of it making it look like he's weak. And again, we end up dealing with the genie once again. Now, Basm will meet up with Roshan once more, which is when we end up learning a bit more about her backstory in her first ever kill. Then she'll task us with finding out more information about this location in which we're in, which is heavily influenced by the Order. We end up meeting up with a man called Kong, who turns out to be someone that Basim knew from his childhood. And during the time of doing a load of back and forth missions, we learn about what this item is, which is a hairpin that they want to acquire. Which eventually leads us to an auction, which we end up trying to buy an item of interest. We learn that the order is also working with the tax collector and the harbour master. We'll then head to the auction and acquire the hairpin, and in doing so, we complete that section, leading us into our next black box mission, the last to complete all four bureaus. We'll win the auction, and the tax collector is now ours to hunt down. After heading through all of the guards, we end up taking down this woman. She'll not really give us much information, but again, we encounter the genie once more. This time, it actually ends up trying to kill Basm, however, we wake up just in time. After updating Roshan, Basm will head to get some rest, and then Nihao will appear when he wakes up. She'll tell Basm that he needs to learn more about why the genie is appearing, and that he shouldn't kill the leader of the Order, and instead, learn more about what they know. You can see that this is now actually becoming more of an inner battle on Basm, and it is starting to erode on his inner citadel, in a way, of what he was retreating to, of just following orders. And we then get sent to learn more about three people. All three of these have connections to the Order in some way, but we're not entirely sure if they are actually linked to them. After a massive faff around with a servant, we learn that this woman is heavily connected to the woman in question that we're looking to take down. We'll then meet up with the governor, who turns out to just be on his own mission. He only truly cares and only sides with the city of Baghdad. He isn't on the side of the Order. And because of that, we end up leaving the governor alive because he didn't really pose an actual threat to the existence of the creed, as he wasn't entirely attached to the order. We end up meeting up with a poet who doesn't actually have a connection of the order, 
And that's when we learn that the wife of the man that Basm witnessed get stabbed right in front of him right at the beginning of the game is in fact the leader of the order. And in this moment we see a very odd thing which you don't really see, which is Roshan trying to argue that she should be the one to assassinate this woman. Roshan will also be pointing out the truth around Basm and his ego. He can see Nihao close by and chooses to side with the person who has been pushing him to learn more. We see Nihao becoming more and more argumentative, in an attempt to push Basm into learning more about what is troubling them both. And it's now time for our final black box mission. We will now take down the leader of the order. I ended up working with the rebels to open the gate to break into the palace as a distraction. Once inside the baths we'll see the son of the woman we seek to kill, which if I'm honest just seems like a really random choice to incorporate into the end of the sequence, it literally adds nothing, but you know, why not? We end up stalking the same servant who was giving us a mess around earlier which leads us to the woman that we seek. She'll end up running away from us until we end up back in the baths, in which she'll then talk to Basm about how he is in fact the key to everything that they've been doing. She'll mention to Basm about how she knows that he is way more than what he's actually aware of. And Basm will try to learn more about it, and she will tempt Basm in learning more. However, just before she can actually do so, Roshan will appear and assassinate her. You end up seeing Basm embrace what has always been there on the sidelines, which is this feeling of being pushed down the wrong side. She offers a helping hand to Basm to follow through with being a part of the order, but Basm doesn't want to take it and is left with the threat of death. Once back to Nihao, Basm will tell her all about what the leader of the order had mentioned. They then choose to head to Alamut to end off the beginning of Basm's story. Once on the ride back to the assassin's headquarters, Basm will become deeply dehydrated. Both him and Nihao will drink from the river and they'll then see it laced with blood. The genie will appear once again coming through the invisible barrier that has been saving him this entire time. We'll then find out that a brother of the creed has saved Basm from everything that had just happened. After making our way through the burning Alamut, we'll find Basm trying to talk to the leader of the creed, Rayhan, the man who I originally thought was going to be betraying us but I was in fact very wrong. He gives Basm the okay to actually enter the temple that the Hidden Ones have been hiding the entire time. Once at the door, Rosham will try to stop Basm. We end up getting a master versus apprentice fight. They'll go back and forth about how Basm is walking down the path of the Order and not the Creed. Basm will spare her life and choose to enter the temple. She says something that I actually think is a great moment that is often overlooked, which is, you don't have to look to the past to know who you are. Who you can be, you can choose. Basm, put your faith in me. This is one of those moments that people would say you can learn a ton from fiction that you actually don't realise when you're just reading them. Something that is definitely true, but Basm is too tempted to follow through with finding out what lies beyond. Once deep enough, we'll find the device at the centre of all of this. The one that we are linked to. Basm has been here before he will realise and see that within his visions that's what he's been seeing. Nihao will then disappear from behind him, and in the centre, a coffin-like machine, she will then appear inside. The game will proceed to show us Nihao never actually existed and was a figment of his imagination. She'll end up showing us what appears to be two Isu fighting one another, and it will bring back the genie once more and shows us that we need to confront it. Basm will confront the genie as he then learns that by confronting it, it will stop all the fear that he has for it, and with that, it then disappears. Nihao will talk to Basm about the world being left behind. He learns that Nihao is just another version of who he is. Once they touch, they become one. Basm is no longer fractured as he once was, and he is now whole in some odd way. Once he gets out of the cave, you'll see him with his brothers once again. Roshan will step away from the order as she doesn't align with the values of this order. She throws her hidden blade away, which later gets the payoff if you play through Valhalla. We see Basm's eagle go to fly down, but as Basm is no longer who he used to be, it actually doesn't fully answer to him. Instead, it cuts him. Basm will then talk in a way that we actually haven't heard a protagonist of an Assassin's Creed game really speak in outside of, I guess, Shay from Rogue, 
which is that anyone who tries to bind him will be hunted. Not in those words, but that's the idea. Which is then when the end credits of this game will roll. Now that I've explained the story and given slight insight into what I liked and what I didn't, I'll now expand on those a bit more and a bit more thoroughly. Starting with the biggest issue that I actually had around the main story. For me, this came down to the whole form of this story being completely unexplainable as to the motives of anyone, from the assassins, Basim, and the Order up until the end of the game. I believe they were able to get away with it due to the game's length, however I found myself on multiple times questioning why we're even doing what we're doing. Why did Basim want to join the Hidden Ones, and why are the Order doing what they're doing? None of these questions get answered up until the end, and even then, it's very weak on some of the reasoning. The Order seek to understand and use the technology of the Isu under Alamut. The Creed are fighting to stop that from happening and knew the whole time that this was what the Order were after but never chose to explain it to Basim at all. The only explanation that actually felt any way meaningful towards this was Basim's motives, which was simply put that he didn't understand his place in the world and can't explain why he wants more. He eventually learns what all of it's about, but the fact that it takes the whole game with next to no indications of telling us what's going on to explain it, in my opinion, isn't a good way to tell a story. We shouldn't be questioning the motives of the main character that we're playing throughout the game, considering the whole point of games is that you're meant to be able to play them from that first person perspective. We're meant to be able to connect to them, but it didn't feel as if Ubisoft knew exactly what they wanted to do, so they just kind of created a generic attempt at a story, but then failed to give us any emotional motives during this game to explain what was going on. The next issue I had with this was its side characters. Every single side character in this game lacks any humanity or feeling of nothing more than voice actors. It's not something specific to Mirage. I would say the last time that we actually got a character that showed genuine emotion was Origins, and only then it was a select few who were able to. Within this game, the characters kind of talk in a way that's more generic and trying to pose this way of like, we're cool in this conversation instead of, you know, doing anything cool. They just kind of talk in a way to make themselves sound more badass. Everyone all seems to be the same with very little emotions. The fact that there's more emotional connection with NPCs in Skyrim shows how this game's characters are just incredibly weak. The best descriptor of this one is something that I've used towards Valhalla, which is that they seem to be able to create characters that feel as if they've got zero life behind them. They're just completely dead behind the eyes. Any jokes that are ever made always feel like they're slightly uncomfortable due to the lack of anything being created to create an atmosphere of anyone enjoying them. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a game that in my opinion every single company that makes single player games should be made to create an entire detailed analysis on why people have an emotional connection with those games, so that we can truly see if they understand what people love about them. Now I do want to talk about what they did right within this game, which I do actually think is way more than what Valhalla was able to do. The first and biggest point in its favour is that it's an actual Assassin's Creed story. It's a story about an assassin within the Creed, pretty simple. We get to see through the eyes of Basim what the Creed was during its time in history. Even though they might be called the Hidden Ones, we see the resemblance to the older games within its narrative. Now though, into the weeds of what I actually thought was great to the story, which as much as I do dislike that they pushed it off all the way to the end, I can kind of understand the reason to, which is the whole game's existence of Nihal. The reason why I actually think this was quite good is because for the first time, an Assassin's Creed game is setting up a reason to play through the game a second time. Because if you do so, you get to see kind of the manipulative tactics that are being used against Basim. I understand why it was made to be such a big reveal, however I do believe that if they were going to be doing it in some way, they should have at least given us some slight subtle signs towards what was going on. Which would have in my opinion made the first playthrough of the game far better, because I would genuinely say a second playthrough of this game feels way better knowing that Nihal is manipulating him instead of, you know, what we end up doing throughout the game, which is we don't really understand what's going on. However, again, I do think it was done relatively well in the way that it was presented to us, even if I do think there was flaws to it. We got to see the proper experience of a character with an Assassin's Creed, dealing with the issues of multiple people existing within the body of one character, which again, I think was handled pretty well. Another part of this story that I actually thought was quite good was the kind of betrayal 
by Roshan later. However, I also think what was good was that throwing off the scent that I mentioned earlier on. And I'll be genuinely honest here, it could just be my stupidity, but I genuinely thought just by the vibe of the leader of the Creed, he just gave me that feeling that he was going to betray us and not Roshan. I do genuinely think that conversation that was done was meant to be an on-the-sly conversation that was intended to kind of make you feel like this guy's going to betray us. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting Roshan to be the person in the slightest. And at points, I actually thought we would just end up against Ali. However, this didn't happen, so I was, again, kind of confused by the end of the game, as I feel like he was doing a lot that other assassins just wouldn't have been okay with. And the game also was good in the sense that we weren't necessarily playing as the good guy, even though because most games that are told, or most anything really, that is told from the perspective of the kind of bad guy, or the anti-hero, is always going to favour that character. Walter White is a very big example of this, where everyone views Walter White as this, like, good guy most of the time, especially on your first watch through, and people hate people like Skylar, for example, even though if you just watch it and you're a bit older, you then realise that Skylar was very understandably angry, and Walter is just a complete dick. From what we got, Roshan was the good guy of this entire story. She kept secrets from Basim, however we know if you've played Valhalla that he wasn't exactly the good guy in all of this. So we never end up truly feeling as if we are actually doing good within the story. I guess it's a mixture of Basim being so unknowing of his role and just following orders that kind of adds to this idea. And I like the fact that this game was more of a shade of grey instead of the black and white storytelling that most of these games follow. Now, one of the biggest complaints around this game is around its length. It took me roughly 14 hours to get through, including breaks, and also me taking short little moments to go do different bits. However, 14 hours is rather short for most modern day games. The biggest argument that I've seen used towards this is that it was brand new on launch for £50, and that you were only getting a 12 hour main story, and at maximum a 25 hour if you were trying to complete all the side content. Which means that most people who are paying for this game were really paying for around £2 per hour to play the game. Which then meant we saw complaints around this game coming from a lot of people that in my opinion probably loved Valhalla a lot, and believing that length equals quality to the player. And I don't really view them as valid points being made at all, if I'm being honest, as I think a lot of people conflate length with value. For example, I'd much rather play The Last of Us over Valhalla any day. However, some people think that this is the wrong answer. They end up believing that if you're paying a load of money for something, then it should be long. Which, even if it's filled with bloat. And I've said that about Valhalla, it is just bloatware. Mirage, in my opinion, was roughly the correct length. And if I'm honest, I'm genuinely surprised the game even got over the 10 hour mark, and I wouldn't be surprised they just added an extra bureau for the sake of getting it over that so that the game wouldn't be moaned at for being under 10 hours. Because again, within this game you can sense those little moments of bloat, which I do think are kind of typical within some of the stories to expand on different areas of character development, but Ubisoft aren't particularly great with character development, so again, it's a double-edged sword considering it looks like they're trying to do something and add value and in reality it's not doing too much. The biggest argument that I can make towards people, which hopefully would convince some people about why you are incorrect on this belief that games need to be longer if you're paying a decent amount of money for it, is that you shouldn't be wanting to waste your time. I've heard so many arguments around the idea of gaming being a waste of time and some games being a waste of time, and I agree and disagree with that statement. And what I'll say now until I make a future video around this idea is that if a game is going out of its way to bloat up, to pump up the runtime, then the companies behind the game are intentionally trying to waste your time instead of giving you a product of true value. Now I want to spend some time and talk about the gameplay. Outside of the story, this is probably the biggest element of this game that people really cared about. It makes sense, as it's a game, so gameplay is incredibly important. This game needs to get a few things right to hit their target audience, and at least prove a good enough experience for the players to feel as if something was actually done correctly. Which was the parkour, stealth, and how they handled combat. So let's talk about all three of those and more. I'm going to start with parkour as this is the most pivotal part of what a lot of people perceive as Assassin's Creed games, and it's what has always been able to differentiate itself from other games out there, or at least it was in the past. 
Within the lead up to this game, Ubisoft said that they took inspiration from Unity when it came to its parkour, which personally, I do find laughable. However, it was definitely a good marketing tactic, as it got people to buy their product. The reason for this is that Ubisoft are very well aware about how beloved Unity is within the core fanbase. They know that if they released a game today with Unity's parkour, then it would 100% sell well, which is why it's really surprising they haven't chosen to do it yet. The reason that I believe it's laughable to say that they took inspiration from Unity is that this game's parkour is almost entirely identical to Valhalla, but with one big change, and that change is the location. The parkour of this game is more similar to Revelations. From the overall feel of the game's map through to the objects you traverse. And that's the primary area that I would say that this game really feels like Revelations, primarily because of the distinction between what Brotherhood was and Revelations. And then they also added the poles within this game, which was cool to be added. However, I literally never used them throughout my entire experience of playing the game. I had to go out of my way to find them and use them. So it's kind of like one of those things where it's kind of like a little hype up when really there wasn't any payoff. I know that there will be complaints about this assessment, however, you're almost entirely wrong if you believe that this game's parkour as a mechanic is different to Valhalla. What I believe this proves is that parkour hasn't ever really been important to innovate on, as really what we're after is the requirement of using it. Within the likes of the RPG trilogy, we rarely got to use parkour as the maps were so big and open that it just meant that they were just redundant. Whereas having the option to use it in this game was borderline necessity if you didn't want to take an age getting around. The next area that was extremely important for them to nail was the stealth, which I do believe they did extremely well, but I don't think they did it perfectly. What I'll give this game praise for is making stealth a requirement and not a feature, something that was missing from most AC titles, but especially the last two games. What I mean by that statement is that AC typically has only been a stealth game as far as it's so-called stealthy when standing in blatant view of everyone. Within Mirage, you actually have to be stealthy if you don't want to be penalised for not doing so. If you approach missions with a guns blazing attitude, then you'll find yourself dead within a matter of minutes. And within this, we also had some bonuses to really help towards that stealth experience, with the inclusion of throwing knives, smoke bombs, noisemakers, traps, and blow darts. They gave us a load of old and loved items that make the stealth experience within older titles to help assist you along the way. Each tool is used in its own way that adds the experience of pushing a stealth game narrative. We feel like a stealth badass throughout the entire game, and the use of all these tools simply expands upon that. My personal favourite was the throwing knives, as it allowed you to take down 5 enemies within a matter of seconds when you can just kill 2 of them really quickly and dive in and take down the rest. It adds to the experience in a way that's been missing in this franchise for years now. In my books, stealth was handled really well. However, I do believe the choice of how they did so was very similar to throwing the baby out with the bathwater within how they handled the combat. Which gives us no better time than now to talk about exactly that. The combat. What can I say about it? Well, I do believe that this is yet another example of Ubisoft knowing that people wanted change, but they never take away the right lessons in what made their prior products successful. I've mentioned this comparison in another video, but for example, Valhalla. We saw a game that really wanted to be The Witcher so badly, but it lacked in the main elements that made the game successful. Within this game, I believe they've done the exact same. In the attempt to give a back to roots game, we saw them dumb down the combat system tremendously. I would say this game has to be by far the worst combat in the entire franchise. I've never played an Assassin's Creed game where the parry window is so big that you can literally look like you are being hit and then still somehow parry it. This again is where I have to come to question with the whole idea of we took inspiration from Unity. As they definitely didn't within the parkour, the next best thing about Unity was its combat, which was slightly harder and more drawn out combat experiences than the original games. Really being good at combat within Mirage is simply waiting for the parry to open like the old games. At least in the old games, the parry window would lock you into a motion instead of this game, where literally you can have two people stunned and one just sits there looking dazed the whole time like they're a Pokemon. The AI within combat in this game is just awfully dumbed down, which is sad to see. However, for as much as AI is dumbed down within the combat, this game does give us a decent amount of variation in its types of enemies. 
We had Archer and Marksman. The only real difference between the two is that Marksman will shoot down your eagle. So if you want to take on a location and deal with them in a manner of knowing every enemy's location, then you're better off taking down the Marksman first and then you can use your eagle right after. We then had Spearmen who weren't exactly difficult to fight, it just meant that you had to focus more on dodging instead of parrying. Then you had Swordsmen who were just your standard enemy type. Next up, and more interesting, would be the Captain. You need to make sure you get your parries off, which as mentioned are easy to do, but also dodge attacks on time, and if you don't, then they'll take advantage of that. And then they also have extreme power attacks, which does mean that you have to be very well aware of when you're being attacked with a power attack, or one that is parryable. Then you have the horn bearer, which is pretty obvious. They carry a horn and they can alert the enemies. However, the last primary enemy type is this guy. He carries a flamethrower and I have zero clue how to pronounce the name, so I'm not even going to try. This means that if you're being teamed up on by just a couple of enemies and one of these guys appears, it will actually make you be somewhat challenged in what you're doing. The last and coolest enemy is then this guy, who yet again I have zero clue how to pronounce. These are bounty hunters that I actually died to a couple of times in my playthrough, especially right at the beginning. They'll hunt you down when you've got maxed out notoriety, a very similar system to something like AC Rogue. The reason that these are the best enemy types in the game is that they actually add a proper level of difficulty. They'll be quick, using two blades, and they'll strike out of nowhere. You'll be smoke bombed, and if you get clipped once, you'll find yourself taking on a couple more hits, and they'll just break through your defences. This means that you actually really need to stay on top of what you're doing to make sure you don't get completely demolished. They have the ability to throw knives and heal as well, which means that you actually have a little bit of a challenge. Even though we have some cool enemies and generally a good diversity in the combatants, all of this gets undermined by the really simplistic combat system of parrying and insta-killing of 90% of the enemies you'll encounter in this game. We have moments that will make the combat a challenge, but overall the experience will only be challenging if you have a diverse set of enemies all at the same time attacking you. It never really feels as if the enemies are on the same level of skill as you outside of the bounty hunter. I want to spend some time and talk about the black box missions, as it's the only real part of Unity that's been brought back in, and I'm glad to see them return. Even though in most cases it feels as if we are simply walking the path of least resistance that was shown in front of us. The reason I'm glad to see these return is that it gives us missions within the game that require stealth to a high degree. We're made to take on encampments without being spotted, as getting spotted will bring on a horde of guards. This means that you'll be looking around for the best routes in the place that you're taking on, and really having to actually think about the layout of this area. Is there a horn bearer? Are there any bells that you don't get more guards appearing? When I utilize my smoke bombs, do I take out a group with haste? All of these are just parts of taking on the black box missions, which is cool. However, the unique part of this mission style has to do with the options to distract enemies and find ways into the forts. This for me is where the game lets the black box missions down the most. I love having the option there, however outside of requiring them to get targets to be visible, they don't really serve much purpose outside of being fake feelings of agency within a mission, when really it's kind of a pushed, nudged way of dealing with a mission. Which is why the best way of describing the mission structure is more like having the freedom to do whatever you want, but you'll probably just follow the path that's directly in front of you. Again, this is something like the stealth that was really nice to see brought back, but it doesn't feel as if they took the right lessons away from Unity success. The reason people liked the black box missions was that you could take down an entire encounter without utilising any of the options, which typically meant you needed to be on top of your stealth and hiding bodies, but you could also use these other events to cause distractions to complete a side objective or just allow yourself into the place you needed to be. This worked within Unity as they never truly felt like a necessity, however they were blended in well enough within the area that you were doing that they never felt like you were doing a runaround. The prime example of this is the first black box mission we did in Mirage. You'll walk down the hill and immediately be greeted by merchants, which just pulls you into doing that option more than anything else. It's all just on the path to the destination, so it never feels like a choice, it feels more like a coincidence. For you to even be able to utilise the merchant though, you need to get your way inside, deep within it, to the point where you're only 10 metres away from the target, to then go all the way back with the merchant and then walk all the way back to the same area so that you can have the target in view. 
It all just feels like a runaround for the sake of it. It's something that definitely wasn't a priority to them in the development and came across as more like an afterthought on how they could have worked the black box mechanics into the game so that that actual, you know, title of saying we took inspiration from Unity could fit in. To take away from the missions, let's talk about something that I actually believe Valhalla did a better job than almost every game in the franchise, which is the gear selection and the diverse ways to play with your loadouts. Within Mirage, we find ourselves having the option of a sword and dagger, which is fine as you get a load of options within those types of swords and daggers. At least that's how it feels on a surface level, but due to the simplicity of the combat, they are redundant. At least Valhalla had a combat system that lends itself well to the loot system. Within that game, they fixed the biggest issue around loot from Origins and Odyssey, which was the sheer amount that meant nothing truly felt unique. So we got decent weapon and armor choices that actually made them feel like you were having a difference in the way that you play. With Mirage, however, due to the easy combat system, there wasn't really any reason to deviate from the original loadout, including the armor. The big boss armor at the end of the game for getting all of the keys is this Isu gear, which is by far one of the worst looking outfits I've seen and also in terms of functionality. The dagger gives you 10% health for every 5 hits you do, which in my opinion is completely useless when you have a combat system that just allows you to get away with standing around and almost missing any parry window but still getting the insta kill off. And the only reason you might find it useful is due to using the sword, which has a really odd thing going on with it, that the sword lowers your maximum health by 50% but increases your damage by 50%. The way that this game's combat system works is that it's really easy to get kills off on enemies as long as you get the parry, but if you somehow miss it, then you'll take a load of damage in comparison to previous titles where typically you take hardly any. This is the main reason why stealth is such a requirement for this game, so that you don't have to deal with that as a possibility. You might end up finding value in that 50% damage increase, but when you can just insta-kill almost any enemy that you lay your eyes on, does it really matter when all you need is for you to miss one of those hits and you're either dead or bordering dead? And the armor is the only thing out of this trio of items that has any utility, and even then, it's rather shocking. Firstly, why does it look like this? I don't understand why everything to look cool needs to be a cyborg. It just doesn't look good, especially when it's meant to be set in a time setting like this. I get it's Isu armor and they're from a different time, but it just doesn't look good. In terms of what the gear does though, is a lightning bolt that stuns anyone nearby with an air assassination, which means that you can escape the scene easily, or just take other guards down really easily. But for that to be the main set of gear for this game and for it all to be that mediocre, it just adds to the story you'll see when playing the game for yourself about how useless changing gear really is and it doesn't add anything to the way you play the game. I get they chose to do this as an attempt to blend old and new Assassin's Creed, but this is yet again another moment of not understanding why something worked in the first place. Then we have the primary ability, which was a bit controversial to say the least. I saw a lot of complaints online about how this would take away from the stealthiness of the game, which I can see why people might believe that. However, there is a really simple way of dealing with that problem just don't use it. I normally wouldn't be that blunt around this sort of criticism, but it seems like such a weak argument to attack an Assassin's Creed game on. The reason for this is that almost every single Assassin's Creed game wasn't really ever that stealthy to begin with. All this does is it allows you to avoid wasting time if you don't want to just sit around and wait for a guard to move position. I don't really have too much to say about the ability as I used it throughout the playthrough, but I never really felt like it was out of place. I don't know if it's that I've come to accept that in most Assassin's Creed games, you have something that gives you a massive advantage over the system, so it doesn't really bother me that this is in the game. We then have the skill tree. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but oh my god, they just don't understand what makes some things work and others not. I believe that if you're going to be putting a skill tree into the game, they might as well have just followed the formula of Odyssey, which had one of the best out of anything we've seen in this entire franchise. You had three unique sections that almost every single upgrade gave you a new ability that could be added to the gameplay. Instead, what we received was a system that had the front of Odyssey, but the guts of Valhalla. We had perk after perk that was simply increasing the general ability or abilities that add almost nothing to the game. 
The only skill that I used the most within this entire playthrough was the ability to pick up my throwing knives, as it was the only thing that I could really take advantage of to add to the experience of what this game is meant to be. Again, I don't really have a massive amount to say about the skill tree, as again, this just feels like another thing that was just an afterthought, instead of a thought out mechanic. The last part of the gameplay that I want to mention is the most frustrating, and I guarantee others would have had the same complaint. Which is why do I have to wait to talk to people when a body gets discovered miles away from me? You can literally kill someone and then run to the other side of Baghdad, the guard finds that body and now you have to wait around or run back and kill them. When I say this, I had a specific moment where I went to enter into an outpost, but I couldn't because a guard discovered a body that was like 700 meters away from me. So I waited around taking down enemies in my location and I was doing this for like 5 minutes and it still didn't go away. I had to run back, kill the guard and then come back to my location to get rid of it in the first place. This is a mechanic that completely irritates me. If I want to get somewhere, just let me in. Stop trying to make me wait around. And now that my rant is over about this, let's talk about the side content. This game has around the same amount of side content as any of the old games. However, that isn't something to praise. If we have a main character, it's nice to see them do things outside of the main content, as it allows us to see other parts of their personality from humour to their suffering. However, within this, the best bit that we actually get is a moment with Hytham. Before we talk about that though, let's talk about the main forms of side content. The most prominent of which is stealing. We have a mixture of side content that gets done by stealing, however, it's not particularly amazing. We have very similar systems in place to steal within this game as you do within fights in cutscenes in Spider-Man for example. Or if you play any of the RPG trilogy, then you'll have very similar experiences within how assassinations work. Overall, the majority of stealing is simply random stuff that doesn't matter and typically is more hassle than it's worth. The main bit of side content that's a bit of a side quest is the Isu gear, which as I mentioned, in my opinion, is not that great. For this, you have to go around and gain 10 keys, and you'll probably find them really easy to find during your playthrough. They're really easy to spot as they'll just pop up on your compass. From there, a simple way to get them is just to throw a smoke bomb, run inside the smoke cloud, and then just run up and kill them. This is yet again another Ubisoft style side content that is nothing more than just collectibles. And talking about collectibles and what's in there for your completionists out there, we then have chests all around the map, which are simply, you know, what is in every single AC game in existence. They don't really add much outside of giving you some money that you can earn throughout the game, which is in this game practically useless considering you don't really end up spending much of it. And the reason for this is that the gear is just useless and doesn't require any upgrades. Contracts on the other hand actually give you a little bit of utility, however they're definitely a thing that you only really need to do if you want to make missions a little bit easier for you. The reason for this is that you'll gain tokens by completing contracts, which can vary from helping someone to a location to taking down a target. This is definitely a worthwhile thing to keep in future games, however I think that they need to flesh it out a lot more. I want contracts that give me the same feeling I get within The Witcher 3. You take on a contract and you know that you have a mini story that you're about to embark on that has a nice little payoff at the end. This is something that I wish we saw within the Assassin's contracts. Whether it's a little bit of story about why someone is so wanted and you can choose then if you want to help them out or not. Or all the way through to doing an investigation like we got within the likes of Unity. I wouldn't say any of the contracts stand out above others as most of them are pretty dull and don't really add anything to Basm's character. They simply act as something to do if you want to 100% the game and make it feel like a slight drag for yourself, and also to get through missions a little bit quicker and easier. However, from time to time you have small little encounters, and the one that actually stood out the most for me is the time where we're speaking to young Hytham. For anyone who didn't play Valhalla, Hytham is Basm's apprentice. However, within this, we see Hytham at a young age, being terrified to jump off a roof. He wants to show people that the hidden ones are cool and that he wants to be just like them. We see Basm giving him some advice and showing us the first interaction between the two of them. This is something that we need to see in general within Ubisoft games that they just don't seem to understand. Moments like this stick with the player as it's a cool reference, but more importantly it shows us Basm's more emotionally caring side. It shows us a version that we rarely get to see within the mainline story, but again, is one of those far and few between moments of this game's side content. 
The side content of this game is no different to almost every single Assassin's Creed game out there. Sadly, they don't seem to care much about this sort of content. If Valhalla had good side content, then the game would have been viewed a lot better. I guarantee that. I also believe that if this game had the time dedication towards side content they tried to put into the likes of Unity, Odyssey and Origins, then they might have actually had a little bit of something. The spark would have been there. And as you can tell, I'd probably say the side content isn't that great. And if anyone at Ubisoft sees this, please talk to whoever is giving you this like completionist style side content to just tell them just to add some depth. Allow us to explore the characters and the worlds themselves through the side content, instead of just giving us completionist stuff. Most players don't want to just run around collecting things, most people want to actually do things that make you feel as if you're learning more about the world or the character and that sort of thing. That's how you ingrain a fan base into these games in particular. Time to talk about the performance and graphics of this game. To clarify right off the bat my statement around this game being similar to AC Rogue isn't just in the sense of the game lacking general content, but also in its quality assurance and graphical fidelity. The first thing that I want to talk about is an issue that appeared for me personally that appears to have been resolved now. The only reason that I'm bringing this up is that I do think it needs to be mentioned as it's something that I went through personally and is something that shouldn't have been in the game to begin with, which was stuttering. I played this game on lawn on PC and it was stuttering almost every three to five minutes. It wasn't frame drops as I was running benchmark tests whilst I was going through the game and it showed that nothing was happening. And before you leave the comments saying your PC is bad, I'm just going to get this out the way. I have a 4080 FE, a 64 gigs of DDR5 RAM and a 13900K which is overclocked to its maximum under warranty. So I know this should run perfectly smooth. Starfield was running perfectly, and that game is by far going to be using up my PC way more to try and deal with the issues that that game has. And as this game came out just before I was going on holiday, I played a little bit of it so that I could talk about it in my whether or not I kind of liked the game on launch, and then now. After my holiday, I came back and an update was done, and it seemed to have fixed the issue. However, again, I just wanted to mention this as I do believe it is needed as, you know, something to mention to people, because, you know, games shouldn't be coming out with stuttering issues, these are things that should have been pretty easily tested right off the bat. Now let's talk about the most noticeable part of this game. I was playing this game in 4K maxed out settings, which then recordings were downscaled to 1080p. However, I played Valhalla. I know this game was made within the same engine, was made originally as a DLC, but somehow doesn't look anywhere near as good as Valhalla. My only suspicion as to why this might be the case is that this game is set in Baghdad, which means the colour and vibrancy wouldn't work out anywhere near as well as something like Valhalla with the, you know, vibrancy of the English landscape. However, one of the biggest things to mention is the choice of chromatic aberration, something that in my opinion was just a truly awful choice. When I'm complaining about this game graphically, this is after I turned this off. I remember playing the game for the first hour and questioning why it didn't look good, why it was so blurry and why it looked like there was constant grain on my screen and I honestly thought there was an issue of my monitor. I then googled why does Mirage look so bad and this setting is on by default. Once this is turned off the game does actually look quite good, however again there just seems to be a weird downscaling of the graphics or at least that's how I feel it is. The issue is a mixture of looking like a graphical downgrade from the previous game and for some reason, every single cutscene never feeling like an actual environment where people are talking. This is a criticism that I had of Valhalla and previous games as well, which is that they've never really been able to master the effect of talking in a space, an open space, in a room, whatever it might be. They've never seemingly been able to do it that well. Skyrim is a game that's a decade older than Mirage, but does miles better at feeling as if you're talking to other characters within the world itself, and not just like they're talking directly into your ear. I believe the best statement to make about this game's graphics is that they aren't awful by any means, but when we've had something like Valhalla, that came before it that in my opinion was a slam dunk in that department and somehow it lacked it in this when the game was literally meant to be a DLC for that game. The reasons for this are rather unknown. My assumption if I was to put money on it would have something to do with the lack of budget that this game had and the team size around it 
and trying to smooth off the edges when it came to its graphics. I also wanted to take a minute and talk about something that I saw when playing the game in various different moments, which was getting stuck in clipping on objects. I'd be running around randomly struggling to get over random different bits. This was really annoying, but it's one of those issues that can be sorted out and isn't overly awful. I agree that we need to ensure that these games come out without these sorts of issues, however again it's one of those issues that isn't so awful that it constantly is cropping up. This issue I believe stems from again the small team in comparison to other games and the lack of funding behind it. And also the fact that this game's entire systems are rooted in a past entry that weren't made to deal with the amount of objects that you're climbing over within the likes of Mirage, which then leads to the game probably being slightly confused. Now though I wanted to talk about one of the most frustrating issues I found within the game, which was throwing knives. I was using them all throughout my playthrough and enjoying using them, however, so many times I would throw them and my aim would just be pushed slightly off. It's similar to how in many games that have things like aim assist, like Mirage does within their throwing knives, it just kind of shoots you off slightly sometimes when you're aiming. I don't understand why this happens in this game in particular though. Anyone who might know, let me know down below. Lastly, my biggest pet peeve, which I would say probably belongs in the gameplay section, however it's a gameplay performance thing, is that when you're using Eagle Vision and you get attacked, you can't actually differentiate between a power attack and a parryable one. Like, I don't really understand why, this is something that I don't really get. It's not like Ubisoft doesn't just stop you from doing certain things when other things are going on. Like I mentioned earlier, where you can't enter a location if a guard discovers a body. It's not like they don't have the ability to just shut it off. Either change the colour when we're using Eagle Vision, or don't allow us to use Eagle Vision when fighting. One or the other would be a lot more welcomed, as I like to use Eagle Vision quite a bit, but then when you're in fights, you literally cannot tell if you're about to be able to parry attack or not. One of the biggest questions for everyone around this game was whether or not it was a return to form for the franchise. The reason that this was such a big topic for many in the fanbase is that this was what they kept trying to push for this game, and on top of that, within the online presence and online conversation around the franchise, a lot of people believed that they had stepped too far away from what was Assassin's Creed. I believe that for this game to be a return to old, it needed to focus on three primary areas. Parkour, stealth, and the story. This game did a decent job in my opinion of all three, but not in the way that most truly thought they would get. This game was the second most stealth focused Assassin's Creed game in the entire franchise. I know that some will disagree with that, however in this franchise you've never truly been stealthy, with the closest thing being tailing missions, which isn't really that much of stealth outside of, basically, don't get spotted when you're staring at them from a distance or on a rooftop. Within the old games, if you went into any encampment, you could literally just walk in and parry attack enemies who typically won't even attack you all at the same time, which made it really easy. The only reason you wouldn't do this is if the easiest method to get what you want is simply by just climbing over it and getting to it that way, or if the mission had a timer. Within this game however, we saw stealth become a requirement. For you to deal with locations, you couldn't just run in. You had to use the tools and think on your feet about the guards' movements, which has only truly been done in two entries, with one being Syndicate and the other being Unity. For both of those games, games, for all their flaws, did give us proper stealth, and wanted you to truly feel like a stealth assassin, and not some random man who just doesn't know how to crouch. The biggest reason that this will be overlooked, however, is due to the approach that they took to combat, as I mentioned earlier. In regards to the parkour, I also believe they did a decent job at this, with the tools at their disposal. It's not Unity's parkour, which is a bit of a letdown for many, but we knew we weren't going to be getting that, especially if you had followed anything to do with the game's development and why it existed in the first place. So no, the parkour isn't on the same level as Unity, with the amount of control the player had over the character's movements. But what they did perfectly is prove that it's not just about the parkour system, but the environment also matters, and if anything, could be more important. In this video, alongside my video about the game on launch, I said the system was far more similar to Revelations than anything else, which I do stand by. This game nailed, for me, my opinion on what I had about this franchise's parkour, something that I've thought about since Syndicate and I've mentioned in previous videos as well, which is that the parkour system doesn't really matter if you have zero requirement in using it. If you have to go to a location that's not adjusted for the systems in place, then you have zero reason to 
use it. Within Syndicate, the parkour was almost identical to Unity, with some dumbed down features. However, due to the massive roads and the gaps between buildings, it made the parkour almost redundant, to the point where we saw a grappling hook introduced just to make it even plausible. Within Mirage though, we saw a dumbed down parkour system that was identical to the likes of Valhalla, and by far is a less frustrating version of what we got within the original set of games, but in an environment that truly makes you feel as if you're traversing something. The parkour is important, however the utilisation of the environment is even more important. Unity was as good as it was because it had both an amazing parkour system, but also the map of Paris, which made you feel as if you were actually using the system in place at a good pace. Mirage did a great job in using its environment in the same way as Revelations, which had a boring parkour system like this game, but due to the density and change in look of what we were travelling across, we got the feeling of genuine movement that was needed and intentional. We then had the story, which is why I wouldn't say this game was a complete home run. As I detailed within the story section, my biggest issue was the lack of transparency on why anything was happening. We never get told about what Basm is after, we never get told about what the Order is after, and we never get told about what the Assassins are after. All we get is vague mentions, and nothing gets answered until the final hour of the game, which in my opinion, as I mentioned earlier, isn't good storytelling and isn't comparable to most previous games within the franchise. What this game does well in its story is what most old games do well as well, which is bringing back the whole idea of being about the Creed, and not some random no one who has zero interesting features and lacks any form of emotion. We ended up getting something from Basm that we haven't seen in this franchise for six years, since the release of Origins. That was the last character we had that had any connection to the Creed and had any form of emotional depth that was wasn't just grunting and just acting up. This game was definitely a good step in the right direction. However, I don't want anyone to not understand the reasons for the change towards the RPG trilogy and what people loved about the old games. If you want to know the full story about why Origins came out, I've made a full video talking about exactly that. This game definitely was closer to what people wanted than what they didn't. However, if we rewind the clocks back to 2015, to when Unity came out and was a complete disaster, and then when Syndicate came out and wasn't received particularly well. The main complaints was how boring the gameplay was, and how stagnant the franchise had got. This game does a relatively decent job in giving us a similar experience, but not going fully for it. One of the biggest reasons it's a good step in the right direction is because it tells a linear story, instead of needing to go full-blown RPG with the endings of your choice, or general RPG mechanics that go over the top. This for me has to be by far the most important change that they could have made within this game. However, to truly answer the question of whether or not it was a good step in the right direction, we need to talk about Ubisoft not understanding what makes their games and other games successful. There's this idea that people struggle to try and understand what made something work. They might take the wrong lesson away about what actually worked and then attempt to implement those exact things into let's say creating a new video, a game, a show or a movie, but it doesn't end up giving them the same success. Ubisoft have been like this for a while now and Mirage and Valhalla are perfect examples. Valhalla wanted to be The Witcher 3, however it fell short in three domains. Those being the main story, side content and characters. I won't go into full depth about this as I want to make its own entire video talking about this but I'll give you a quick rundown. Instead of taking away from The Witcher what people truly loved about the RPG mechanics, the entire world plus its side content, its main story and the depth in characters, what did Ubisoft do? They heard that people liked side content but didn't realise the side content meant that it added depth to the world and added depth to the characters. Within Valhalla you had the main character and the entire cast if we're being honest that lacked any emotional depth. So instead of realising that people loved Geralt, Ciri and Yennefer for the emotional depth that they had and the value they added to the story, all they saw was the RPG elements. So instead of having any form of emotion, they decided to say, you can do whatever you want within our guidelines. They saw the success of the side content, and instead of taking away from that that people love extra side content that allows us to see more of Geralt's demeanour, but also interesting stories being told that adds depth to the world we're exploring, 
No, instead, what they took away from it was that maybe you could add a minute long here and there that lacks any emotional depth, and all it gives you at best is a slight laugh that comes in the form of a slight nose exhale. Lastly, within the main story, they saw people's love for that story, and it being decently long, and they didn't take away from that, you know, the love for the story, or the compelling story that it was telling. What they took away from it was the length. That's truly what they believed people cared about it. The reason all of this is important is due to the reasons behind this game. It is a pattern of behaviour from Ubisoft. They seem to be scrambling for ideas of what makes other games work, their old games and how they did well, but really they don't take away any of the right lessons. Within Mirage we had a few areas that highlighted these issues for me, which was the combat, main story, side content, and inventory upgrades. All of these were being compared to the likes of the old and new games to try and create the best of both worlds. What ended up happening, however, was a cluster of half-baked systems that worked within the new or old games that weren't the reason for anyone's enjoyment of either of those areas. For starters, we had the combat. I don't want to harp on too much about how they dumbed down this entire thing as I've already mentioned it throughout the video. However, to make my point, I need to mention it slightly. It's a dumbed down combat system to copy the old style of combat, however, it's too dumbed down. With the massive parry windows and blatantly obvious attacks that make the combat way too easy to deal with. The only reason that they can get away with it is due to the amount of guards that they'll put within an area in certain situations. If they didn't and they had the same diversity of guards as they did within the likes of Unity, then you probably would have been able to just walk into most areas in each encounter and deal with them head on. What this game took from the old games is that people preferred the old combat system, which is the case to an extent but people liked the combat system from the likes of Unity that wasn't just one hit parrying most enemies. It meant that you had to take your time. With there being no clear colour change to show heavy or light attacks, it meant that you could be caught off guard by general attack patterns, which at least made the game a little bit of a challenge. So instead of taking away that the reason why some players prefer the old games is because it was less focused on combat, as we saw within the likes of Valhalla, and more elegant and way more stealthy, what they chose to take away was that they preferred the coddling system of fighting within the first load of entries. Valhalla at least made fighting way more fun to deal with for the first 10 hours, whereas this game just lacks massively in this department. We then get to the main story, which again is a really odd one for me. I don't understand how the story was made in this way, outside of its intent being to get something that resembles the old games without the budget of how those old games would have been made if they were made now. To explain to this properly, we have to go over the glaring issue within the last few entries, but Valhalla was the biggest offender for, which was the over the top length in its story. Making a game 60 hours for the sake of it, with most of the main content being bloat. Mix that with the big criticism of the new games, which is delving too much into the RPG mechanics, and not having a proper protagonist with an actual personality that ends up coming across like you're just having over the top reactions to really small issues. So what did they do? They lowered the story down to 12 hours, which was actually a good move. They made it a linear story game, which was again, a good move, as they realised that people liked that about the old games. But instead of thinking, did our audience like the Ezio collection because they loved the linear story of Ezio, or because Ezio had depth to his character development, and it was clear that he had understandable motives? Well, obviously they didn't, otherwise I wouldn't be asking that rhetorical question. So they chose to go down the most baseline level of storytelling. Instead of an underlying reason that was hinted at and explained as the story goes on, we got a story that doesn't feel like it wants to explain anything, and views you as just a person wanting to play an AC game for the sake of being an AC game. We got a character with more emotional depth than Eivor or Cassandra, but way less emotion than someone like Connor, which is really saying something. We might have got a linear story, but we didn't actually get anything that gave us justifications for what was going on, nor did we see any depth to the characters that were coming along for the ride. 
So instead of Ubisoft taking away from Odyssey and Valhalla's main criticisms around its story is that it's got bloat, lacks emotional depth, and a protagonist with a clear and understandable motive, instead of taking away those criticisms and really thinking about what made people love the old games, they chose to take away that simply people wanted to follow one character with zero change in the story. No matter the choices, and what we wanted was it to be relatively short and follow an assassin. One part of that is true, however, it totally lacks in everything else. Side content is something Assassin's Creed has always struggled to do well, most of it being collectibles for the completionists among us. Most of the side content within most AC games as I mentioned was either collecting things like feathers or, you know, doing some things that were like mini games. Within the RPG trilogy, we did see them attempt to combat this with some decent side content from time to time within Origins and Odyssey. Even Valhalla had parts of the main story that in my opinion, were going to be side content, but they for zero reason decided to just shove it into the main story. Well, I say zero reason, I mean they just wanted the number to get up to 60 hours. But if it wasn't something that was within the main story, I guarantee you it would have made for good side content. This game wasn't much different though. We got Assassin's Contracts, but they had zero proper story being told, and nothing that was really that rewarding or fun for the player. Instead of taking away from Valhalla's criticism of the lack of depth to its side content and zero added reason to explore, they chose to not do that sort of content, which is great. But they chose to try and do something very similar to the old games, closer to a completionist-like style where you have the illusion of actual side content. Again, a weird takeaway, instead of looking at games like Skyrim, like The Witcher 3, or like Red Dead 2, on what made all of those games have great side content, they decided just to say, you know what, our old games did well, the side content in those games, you know, nobody really cared about, but those games did well, therefore we'll just take the side content from those and put them in here. Then lastly, we had the item items that we acquire along the way and the loot, which to me was the biggest absurd lack of understanding Ubisoft had towards anything in this entire franchise. We've enjoyed the systems of gear upgrades since AC2, which if you want to learn more about it, you can always check out my AC2 video essay, it goes fully into depth and talks about the economy system that was added and why it was added in the first place. However, within Odyssey, the main issue was the amount and the abundance of loot, which they then fixed within Valhalla. One of the biggest things that you can give Valhalla is they didn't go over the top with the amount of loot that you were getting. They made each armor set and weapon, for the most part, feel somewhat entirely intentional, instead of just more for the sake of more. This game had a really similar system, but they decided to dumb it down with only allowing you to change out from robes, a dagger, and a sword. Personally, I didn't like the limited customization in regards to it, but what really pushes it over the edge for why it's just weird and absurd takeaways is that there was no reason to use anything different. You never actually need to, nor does it really change the way that you play the game by making your armor or weapons different, and for the most part, it's completely unnecessary. I don't really understand why they did this, as Valhalla actually had a good system in place, but I guess they took a lot of the criticisms of that game and just said, well, maybe we should just change the whole thing. Honestly, if they actually did that and they went full blown like we're gonna make it like the old games, I would have preferred them just to go full blown AC2 and just made it a gradual upgrade that you got extra health when you upgraded your gear. That would have made it a lot better, either that or just had the Valhalla approach, where the gear actually meant something. All of that is to say that Ubisoft don't seem to understand the reasons for theirs or other games' successes. Only taking away the material lessons instead of the most valuable parts of the experience of playing the game, which is the emotional connection and feeling of progression that previous games have and have done well. The game was definitely a step in the right direction, but it lacks in enough elements that can only come down to surface level research in what made the games good in the first place. Assassin's Creed Mirage was a game that tried to be what the fans would love, and for a 15 hour experience of what the game is, it's definitely able to give you that feeling of what the old games might have been. The game is definitely okay. I don't like doing a rating system, so what I'll leave you with is that this game, if it's on sale and you're able to, and you're interested in playing a somewhat modern take on the old games, then yeah, make sure to pick it up. 
However, if you truly just want the feeling of the old games with good graphics, then just buy Unity. It's way cheaper almost all the time, and you will probably enjoy the characters, enjoy the world, the parkour, everything about it way more. This game really wanted to bring back the old fans, however, it lacks in too many areas to be ranked up against any of the old games. I did enjoy my time enough in this game, enough to say that it was playable, but not enough to truly sink my teeth in and want to play more with this character and actually learn more about the character and the story in the world. Within the old games, the biggest complaint that most people had was the lack of DLC or sequels to the main characters on each release. For this game, didn't add enough to the character of Basm to even warrant the choice of having another game. The biggest takeaway, in my opinion as an Assassin's Creed fan, is that Ubisoft simply got lucky with the initial set of games, or they at least had a good team leading the ship back then. Since Unity, that ship became fractured. With little to any structure to give cohesion to what was happening in the world, or truly a direction the franchise was going in. I hope Ubisoft takes some time to learn more about what made the old games special, and what people genuinely liked about the new games, and find a way to fully merge the two in a successful manner. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, make sure to leave a like and do subscribe to the channel. If you want to support any further, then make sure to go head over to the Patreon to get early access to videos like these, and you can have the ability to, you know, get a different role in my server on Discord, which make sure to come join that as well if you're interested. And on top of that, you can talk one-on-one -on -one with me, either in DMs, but also within the Discord, within our little group for people who are joining through the Patreon. Also, you can help out in terms of future videos for the channel and give me your thoughts on different upcoming ideas or videos that you would like me to look at doing. So make sure to go head over to the Patreon if you are interested. And with that all being said, this was an Exiled Critique, something that I have not done in a very, very long time. I can't wait to do a lot more of them, but I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one.